this week. A quick review of Masonic Con Kansas 2022. We'll hear about some of the highlights. Then I step aside and let worshipful brother Patrick Day take center stage for an all new Masonic Mythbusters. Many esoteric Masons the world over have cited Rudolf Schneiner's alternate Rosicrucian Hiramic legend. Some have taken it to heart. But where did Steiner get the ideas that are contained within his Rosicrucian true Hiramic legend? This magical story of Hiram who jumps into the fire and meets Tubal Cain and is gifted the secrets of the ages. A tale of love, deceit, and even murder. Is it to be taken all for true? Brother Patrick Day takes us all the way back to the origin of this tale that's been copied no less than two or even three times. Get ready to have your minds blown. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 560. The WCY podcast is brought to you and everybody in the whole world thanks to our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners who have continued to support this podcast with your generous financial support for over 10 years. As I mentioned, we have various levels of support, including options to make one-time donations. And if you're curious on how you can help support the WCY podcast and its mission to bring Masonic light to those interested in the royal art, and of course, it's kindred sciences. Head on over to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can help. Other ways you can support the show, of course, are through our bookstore, which are all Amazon links back to books that we've mentioned on the show, whether they were authored by the people who have come on the show, their personal recommended reading lists, or my own recommended reading lists. They're all just through an Amazon affiliate sale, and all sales go through Amazon. It's great because the author gets a sale, the WCY gets a few pennies, and it doesn't cost you anymore, and you get a great text. We've also got a shop where you can pick up our limited edition producer's pin, which is exclusive to the producers of the WCY podcast. I've also got several leather items that will be available uh, on another website soon. We're getting Skull and Crown back up and running. But as for right now, we are doing a handmade bespoke leather keychain that uses full grain leather that I cut out, that I punch and sew and laser engrave. The reverse side, I can put your lodge name, logo, maybe your Grand Lodge seal. We can test out any number of engraving options for you on the other side, even if it's just your initials or a monogram or family crest, something. Uh, Anything's pretty much open. But get in contact with me if you are curious. I am doing uh, lots of different custom orders with them. I recently did 20 keychains for the California Widow's Sons. One side features the Widow's Son logo. The other side has the WS with the word Cali inside the W. Uh, They came out really great. I'll post pictures of them later on so that you can see. Uh, I've also picked up another custom order for a lodge that is, uh, I'll be doing 30 of them for their members. So uh, again, these are made to order. They do take a little while for me to put them together because, again, I am cutting them, punching them, sealing them, burnishing them, laser engraving them, all of that by hand. So they do take a little bit of time. Now, Uh, I want to give you guys a quick rundown, Masonicon Kansas wrapped. We couldn't get the show out on time. I was just so busy last week preparing for the con and then, of course, getting home and having back to work. My goal was to have this to you uh, by the following Monday, and of course, it's later and later and later, and I do have to apologize for that. Rest assured, the next episode, uh, this episode will come out as soon as it's ready, and the next episode will come out on time. I'm really excited about our next episode. We had a spur-of-the-moment opportunity to interview Brother Bob Cooper, the Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And this is thanks to Brother Christian Stebbins, who has been one of our legacy partners. And he, of course, brought us our episode with Frank Conway, who wrote the Masonic Pageant, the Northern Masonic Jurisdictions book on the Scottish Rite. Now, uh, Brother Chris came to me and he said, listen, we have a great opportunity to do this. Can you make it happen? So we did, and uh, that episode should be, in fact, the next episode after this one. So 561, look for it. I want to talk a little bit about Masonic Con Kansas before we get into the meat of the episode. Now, Masonic Con Kansas was an epic event. 
Our brother Alex Powers and his family did a tremendous job in putting together everything. I have to thank Alex. I have to thank all of the presenters. I have to thank Brother Jason Richards, who came out to the event uh, as a sponsor of the event through the Masonic Roundtable. I want to thank uh, Brother Jason, John, and Joe. Uh, I missed Brother John. He was not in attendance, and uh, it hurt my heart a little bit, but uh, we all know that we can't be everywhere all the time. So Brother John was really cool. We got together a little powwow on the the night before, and we decided that, uh, you know, TMR is a sponsor. We wanted to buy pizza for everybody. And as Brother Nicholas Lane has said of uh, Castle Island Virtual Lodge, pizza magically disappears. People love pizza. (laughs) So we bought some pizzas. We had a really great time. And then the next day we kicked off with uh, first thing in the morning, had a great presentation by Brother Robert Marshall from Texas talking about Cagliostro. And this is a wonderful topic because there's a lot of missed opportunity to talk about Cagliostro because everybody thinks he was like some kind of a clandestine mason that you can't talk about him and that the history is too weird to talk about. And really, I think that Brother Robert Marshall demystified it and brought about a new understanding of Cagliostro and all of the things that were going along with him. So uh, if you ever get a chance to hear that presentation, you take up that opportunity because it was fantastic. We had several presentations throughout the day. Patrick, I mean, you can see all the speakers on their website. I don't need to go through it, Uh, but they were all very fantastic. Probably my favorite of the day was indeed Brother Robert Marshall's, which is why I mentioned it. And it was first thing in the morning. So you know, uh, with limited amounts of sleep, I was still thoroughly immersed in the story he was telling us. Brother Alex Powers did announce that there is a Masonic Con, Kansas, 2023, in the works. Grand Lodge of Kansas loved the event. They came out. They were very supportive, and I just couldn't believe it. Brother Michael Stoops, past Grand Master of Kansas, uh, immediate past master, I should say, uh, gave a, a wonderful speech that evening as well. I've been sharing some of the quips that I took from his speech as uh, quotes that I've been sharing on our Instagram page and uh, subsequently the Facebook feed. Check those out. I hope they spur some conversation. But in the interest of getting into the education this week, we have a special edition of Masonic Mythbusters that Brother Patrick Day has put together for us. In this particular Masonic Mythbusters, he takes on the tale of Daner Vall's writing about an alternate hieramic legend that later Masonic author and Anthroposophical Society founder Rudolf Steiner pushes forward as a true Masonic slash Rosicrucian mystery, this interesting alternate version of the Hieramic legend. Many esoteric Masons, myself included, have heard the story, wondered about its existence, and have chalked it up to perhaps others who are a little bit deeper have started to take this as the true origin of the Masonic legend, which may or may not be a shame. I'm not doing any readings this week. We are playing this Masonic Mythbusters in its entirety. Let's get into it. In a digital landscape filled with historical inaccuracy, out of context quotes on memes and sound bites, there is an epidemic of fraternal occult, mythological, and historical misinformation. It's time to set the record straight. Masonic Mythbusters with Patrick Day. Sometimes Masons, especially esoteric Masons, can get tunnel vision. It is important to branch out a little bit in what one is reading and researching. If you only ever read esoteric Masonic books, you will only ever get the same stuff rehashed through the same filter for the last two plus centuries. I believe the mystery of Rudolf Steiner's Temple Legend is a great example of how I personally would have never discovered the origin of that story had I not decided to read something totally unrelated to anything else I'd previously been researching in masonry. In 2012, shortly after I became a Master Mason, I came across an essay by Rudolf Steiner called The Mystery Known to the Rosicrucians, which is a very bizarre variation of the hieromic drama of the Third Degree and is, according to Steiner, a parable told by Christian Rosenkreutz to his followers. The tale is... strange. And that's being generous. 
According to Steiner, Hiram Abiff is a descendant of Cain, and Cain was the illegitimate son of Eve and one of the Elohim. Elohim, while being a name for God, uh, is a plural word, literally meaning gods. And Cain is the source of Hiram's artistic genius. Uh, a bit of a romantic drama is introduced into the Hiramic drama in which Balkis, the Queen of Sheba, comes to Jerusalem. King Solomon falls madly in love with her, and she sleeps with him, and even consents to be his bride. But then she meets Hiram, and is captivated by his fiery eyes. Thus, becoming enamored with him, this made Solomon very jealous, inciting conspiracies and murder. But Solomon still needed Hiram to finish the temple complex, with only the molten sea left to finish. Hiram's assistant discovers three apprentices are conspiring to ruin the molten sea. But Solomon would do nothing. The casting of the Molten Sea is successfully sabotaged, and while standing amidst the ruins, flames, Hiram hears the voice of Tubal Cain calling him to jump into the fire. And upon leaping into the fire, he is taken to the center of the earth and initiated into the mysteries of fire. He is given Tubal Cain's hammer and a golden triangle worn around his neck. And he returns to salvage the Molten Sea and does so successfully. The Queen of Sheba consents to be Hiram's wife, but they are never wedded, for Hiram is murdered by the three apprentices. And before he perishes, he tosses the Golden Triangle into a well. Solomon orders a substitute for the Master's word, for he fears the apprentices have extorted it. And upon picking up a not quite yet dead Hiram, Hiram points to the well for the recovery of the triangle. Yeah, th this sounds a lot like the Hieromic drama, the third degree, albeit with an immense amount of embellishments and capricious modifications. Now, Steiner takes this legend very seriously. He appears to believe it is a very real variation of the Hieromic drama, and possibly an early version. Now, Pardon my French, but where the hell did he get this? Steiner is clearly borrowing this from somewhere, as I doubt he made it up. He just has never really struck me as the kind of person who is that clever. But rather someone who misinterprets and misrepresents, uh, but not completely someone who just makes stuff up. Thankfully, if you have the same copy of Steiner's Temple Legend as I do, it is annotated by one of Steiner's dis disciples who will quickly point you to Charles Heckthorne's Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries. Heckthorne prefaces his entire section on Freemasonry with a much lengthier version of the Hieromic drama as Steiner gives, but with way more detail. The fact that Heckthorne prefaces the section on Freemasonry with this legend indicates that he believes this version of the Hieromic drama is the original or an earlier version that was foundational to later Masonic legendary and symbolism. So let's just get right into Heckthorne's version as it differs from Steiner. According to Heckthorne, Hiram Abiff, whom may also be known as Adoniram, is a descendant of Cain via Nimrod. Basically, Jehovah made the sons of Cain subservient to the sons of Abel for the transgression of the Elohim that copulated with Eve, as well for the murder of Abel. The Elohim here are really just fire genie, for whatever reason Hecthorn thinks they're synonymous. Anyway, the sons of Cain know each other by the sign of the Tau, being the Greek letter shaped like a T. Tubal Cain dug a bunch of subterranean caverns in the earth to save his race from the flood, and after the flood, the wife of Ham sought a sexual union with Tubal Cain's son, and they begat Nimrod, who would then go on to be the builder of the Tower of Babel. Jump forward in Hecthorne's legend, the Queen of Sheba falls in love with Hiram because of his mesmerizing demeanor and his ability to organize the craftsmen of the temple complex. Almost magically. He makes the sign of the Tao and they just kind of sort themselves out. The Queen's love of Hiram incites Solomon's jealousy, and he seeks to ruin Hiram by humiliation. Three fellow crafts were denied promotion to become masters by Hiram, and they sought to ruin the completion of the Brazen Sea. 
Uh, the fellow crafts are named Fanor, who is a Syrian mason, Amru, a Phoenician carpenter, and Batusael, a Hebrew miner. Uh, Hiram's assistant is named Benani, uh, who warns Solomon, but Solomon just ignores him. The casting of the Brazen Sea, as expected, turns to ruin. Hiram leaps into the flames and descends into the kingdom of Cain, where the, quote, Tyrannous envy of Adonai ceases. Tubal-Cain tells Hiram of the weakness of Adonai, which is God, how ungrateful the sons of Adam have been, and that the worship of fire will be restored. Uh, he gives his hammer to Hiram and sends Hiram back with the blessing of the fire genie, and the brazen sea is salvaged. Hiram and Balkis uh, profess their love to each other, and they are destined. Union is foretold by Hiram making the sign of the towel, and a bird called Hadhad lands on Hiram's wrist. The queen's nurse, Sarahil, proclaims this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Solomon is now like super duper upset, and he gives the fellow crafts permission to remove his rival. So they take that to mean they can murder him. Now, before Hiram's death, he throws the golden triangle that he bears, uh, that bears the master's word upon it that hangs around his neck, he throws it down a well. And the fellow crafts then bury the body on a lonely hill and cover it with an acacia. After seven days of absence, Solomon reluctantly orders for the search of Hiram, which was discovered by three master masons. And for security purposes, the master's word was changed to the first word spoken while exhuming the body. When the skin slipped off the bone, the workers cried out, Makbenok! Uh, according to Hechthorn, this translates as either the skin is off the bone or the brother is smitten, because those are so similar in translation. Anyway, the murderers are not captured, but they did later commit suicide, and then their heads was brought before King Solomon. The Golden Triangle was later discovered, which Solomon ordered to be placed upon a triangular altar in the secret vault under the temple, and was concealed with a cubic stone upon which were inscribed the sacred law. Then the vault was walled up, and its existence would only be known to the 27 elected keepers. Yay, thus concludes Hechthorn's variation. Uh, so once again, where the hell did he get this? Now, later... In his Encyclopedia of Secret Societies, Hechthorn, in his dissertation on Freemasonry, does discuss the Hieromic drama, as is the common version that is more or less compatible with most lodges in the United Kingdom and the United States. It's the version we're more or less familiar with. However, Hechthorn seems to believe that this weird temple legend is the more complete version. There are a, a number of things we can dig into, such as the elements of the Royal Arch, and quite possibly Scottish Rite, and certainly those are worth digging into. Uh, however, our concern here is less with how these strange variations of the Hieronic drama fit into current day Freemasonry, and more tracing where these versions are coming from, and why they are so bizarre and strange and different. Firstly, there are the three fellow crafts, who now seem to have names, and not the names we're used to. They also have nationalities and professions. Uh, Fanor is a Syrian mason, Amru is a Phoenician carpenter, and Matusael is a Hebrew miner. How intriguing. Uh, second, Hiram has an assistant, whose name is Benani. Also intriguing. Uh, then there's the Queen of Sheba, who has a nurse, with a name, Sarahil. Also curious. Uh, further, there is a mystical bird, Hadhad that fulfills a prophecy. Still curious. Further, the sacrilegious claim that God persecutes the descendants of Cain, who somehow survived the flood, uh, that Solomon and the entire genealogy of Seth are absolute fools, and that one day everyone will abandon God and return to the worship in fire. Uh, lastly, there's the strange version of the Master's Word, Macbenach, of which I am unfamiliar with any lawfully recognized lodge system that uses this word or acknowledges its interpretation. To quote Alice, curious and curiouser. Now we need to acknowledge that Hechthorn was not a Freemason. That much we know about his own attestation and his repeated criticisms of the fraternity as being pointless. He literally thought Freemasonry was stupid. Next, we need to ask, could Hechthorn have made this up himself? Well, 
we know he didn't make it up, as we'll get into, but it should be further recognized that Hecthorne is compiling an encyclopedia, and he isn't very creative. Uh, in fact, he seems so unimaginative that he details really any rumor of secret societies that he can find without any critical thinking of uh, fact, or fiction, or even relevance, so yeah, I doubt it. As an aside, this is the bit where it becomes important to research outside of typical Masonic avenues. But one gets too myopic when you only read Masonic materials. Now, I had first begun to explore the origins of Steiner's Temple Legend in 2012, shortly after becoming a Master Mason. And I ran into a wall real quickly. In 2016, I had taken a break from Masonic research and decided I wanted to read some of the Bohemian authors. Baudelaire, Rimbaud, uh, Verlaine, Gerard de Nerval, uh, and even dipping into the beat writers like Burroughs, Kerouac, Ginsburg, etc. And a few outlying wonderful weirdos like William Beckford's Vathek. It was upon reading de Nerval's autobiographical novel of his adventures in the Middle East, Journey to the Orient, that I stumbled upon the origin of Steiner and Hechthorn's Temple Legend. It was, it was a total accident. So, there is merit in being patient in research, and I admonish you to take a break and just read something completely unrelated from time to time. Now, on to Gerard d'Interval. Gerard d'Interval was a very bizarre guy. He resides in my list of what I like to call wonderful weirdos. <laughs> He sits there alongside of some of my favorite wonderful weirdos like George Bataille, William Burroughs, Douglas Darden, Antonin Artaud, and a handful of others. He was likely manic depressive, having long bouts of depression over a pending perdition, he would have mental breakdowns, etc. Ultimately, he would commit suicide by finding the darkest alley in Paris he could find and hanging himself in a storm drain by a corset string, which he called the Garter of the Queen of Sheba. But he was also well-traveled, he was uh, wonderfully eccentric when he was uh, in a good mood, he had a pet lobster named uh, Thibault that he would take on walks on a blue ribbon through the Palais Royal in Paris. Yeah, he's a wonderful weirdo, I love him so much. Uh, I highly recommend his collection of poems called the Chimeras, uh, if you want to explore it at all more, as well as uh, a very recently translated of his uh, The Illuminated. Now, in 1851, Gerard Nerval published his Journey to the Orient. It is an autobiographical novel which isn't exactly concerned with facts of his travels in the Middle East, but true to Denerval's style, he skews details and rearranges things to fit a symbolic narrative of his own creative genius. And he was a genius. Uh, Antonin Artaud wrote a wonderful essay on uh, Denerval's Chimeras, in which he argued that, quote, Far from seeing Gerard Denerval explain through mythology and alchemy, I would like to see alchemy and myths explained through the poems of Gerard Denerval. So as we delve into de Nerval's story of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and Hiram Abiff, I think we should abandon everything Masonic. Forget Freemasonry. Try not to interpret de Nerval's tale through your knowledge of the Masonic dramas and degrees, and rather try to reinterpret Freemasonry through de Nerval's absolute genius. De Nerval claims this tale was told in a cafe while he was in Istanbul. He calls it the story of the Queen of the Morning and Soliman, Prince of the Genie. It is a truly brilliant tale, wonderfully poetic and utterly compelling. It is largely a symbolic tale of the struggles of the genius of the artist, told in a way that Ayn Rand could only dream of executing in the Fountainhead. Uh, Steiner and Hechthorn both do the tale injustice because, truth be told, Denerval's tale is beautiful, delightful and they turned it into a total Masonic blunder with their sort of matter-of-fact telling of things they didn't even begin to understand. I, I could not pretend to convey the brilliance of this tale. It's about 80 pages long, and an abridged tailing will not cover the mindful symbolism, 
uh, poetic word plays, mythological ponderings, uh, occult theories, and various syncretisms. Thus, Hecthorne's iteration, as I previously stated, will suffice more or less for the plot. Here, we're just going to focus on particulars and explore their meanings and ideas. I really would just recommend you pick up a copy and just, just even flip to this section and just read it. There's no way I can ever give it justice. Now, I think it might be prudent to implement a bit of what Deleuze and Guattari call schizoanalysis. Rather than try to be methodical, linear, and coherent in analyzing something, we ought to think like a schizophrenic. Perhaps in the way many conspiracy theorists think, by drawing bits of data from a broad spectrum of sources to come to conclusions. A madness to the method, if you will. And Dan Nerval was mad. It's crib, Captain Ahab, he was madness maddened. So, to truly appreciate his genius and insane mind, uh, being a bit schizophrenic and analyzing his tale is probably called for. Uh, I don't want to get too crazy with this, so I will try to keep things a little coherent, but a post-structuralist as myself, schizoanalysis seems necessary. Now, Hecthorne calls Hiram Abiff Adoniram once, and subsequently refers to him as Hiram thereafter. Likely this is because Denerval calls him Adoniram, strictly Adoniram. Now, given his immense knowledge of the Bible, uh, I doubt Denerval is confusing the two characters, but rather is playing into the etymological similarities of their names. Hiram literally means like exalted brother or possibly uh, noble birth. A bee or a biff literally means my master or my father. Thus, Hiram a biff could be translated as something like my master is exalted. Adoniram, on the other hand, is a conjunction of Adon. Uh, which is Hebrew and translates as lord or ruler or master, and Iram, uh, which can mean noble birth. Uh, thus, Adoniram can mean the master is exalted. Now, confusing these two distinct persons in the Bible is a blunder committed by Masons in the past, and has given rise to an entire branch of Masonry called Adoniramite Masonry, which uh, did eventually die out. And according to Albert Mackey, thank God. But given Dannerball's predilection for etymology, wordplay, and poetic license, the naming of the characters it, it is more likely they just simply swap the names for the two people simply because, I would conjecture, etymologically it made no difference. Another possible reason for using Adoniram over Hiram Abi is that uh, Hiram Abi's death is not discussed in the Bible, where Adoniram is described as being stoned to death. He has other variations of names of these previous personages we've talked about, such as um, uh, he'll call her the Queen of Saba, um, also called the Balkis, King Soliman, etc. Uh, I always stay true to the pronunciation of his spelling, so sorry if it gets a little confusing, but it's important to distinguish Denerval in the way that he wrote. Now, Denerval's Adoniram is described as being very solitary, preferring to work and create rather than socialize, which makes him very unlikable amongst his peers. Uh, his genius and great skill furthers this disdain. Where he's from and where he learned the mastery of his art is a great secret that he keeps. All he tells the Queen of Saba is that he has, quote, traveled through many lands. My native land is everywhere the sun shines. Adoniram being a descendant of Cain, then a, a, a life of wandering and travel is appropriate, as Cain was a wanderer in the land of Nod, Nod being the Hebrew root uh, of the verb to wander. He claims two sources for the greatness of his work. Quote, Solitude was my first master. The other source of inspiration is a mysterious subterranean cavern carved by some ancient people and that he had spent many years inside of this cavern, uh, studying the strange figures and creatures depicted therein. King Soliman claims this cavern to be a remnant of the, quote, impious city submerged by the waters of the flood, the vestiges of the evil Anokia built by the giant lineage of Tubal and the city of the sons of Cain. 
Uh, Nokia in this case is Enoch, meaning uh, dedicated or established, and is the mythic city built by Cain. Now, while a solitary and disliked individual, Adoniram has one faithful confidant and assistant named Benani. The source of the name Benani has been a point of contention. One conjecture is that he got the name from the poet Petrus Borel, uh, who was a friend of Dinderval, who had a brother that died young, whose name was Benani, uh, whom Borel uh, commemorates in a poem. Benani is also the name of the son born of the legendary, uh, tragic Merovingian heroine Genevieve de Bourbon. But a reasonable source for the name comes from the book of Genesis as this was the name of Rachel, called her youngest son, uh, the child she died giving birth to, but whom we know better as Benjamin. Uh, Benani literally means son of my sorrow. All this should foreshadow the tragic death of Benani before the end of Dinnerval's tale. Now, Balkis, the queen of Saba, being the queen of the Sabians, is from Yemen, and her beauty and charm draw Solimon's affection. Solomon constantly tries to impress her, uh, especially since she came to Jerusalem to know his wisdom and to test it, as well as to see the grandeur of his city. But Denerval presents Solomon as a vain, prideful fool. Uh, when Balkis uh, renders compliments to the work of Adoniram, uh, Solomon illustrates his pride and vainglory by saying things like, quote, it was I who gave all the orders and have paid the workmen. It was I who gave the directions and determined the materials that should be used. Adoniram had to follow the flights of my poetic imagination. <laughs> he further demonstrates his vanity when he tells her how long it takes to build his palace and the temple. So, she remarks, seven years will be enough to find a shelter worthy of your god though it took 13 years to construct a suitable establishment for his servant? Ouch. Now, the nail in the proverbial coffin for Solomon to win the affection of Balkis was when uh, she discovered that the vine Noah had planted after the flood was uprooted to make way for the foundations of the temple altar, and she sculled him for it. Now, Balkis carries little, less and less for Solomon uh, throughout the tale. Uh, she did, however, become taken in by Adoniram's intelligence, his large stature, and his occult powers. So many people had come to Jerusalem from across the kingdom when they heard that the Queen of Saba was in town. Uh, the thousands of citizens amongst the thousands of craftsmen created much confusion, but Adoniram arranged them all according to rank by a simple sign of the symbol of the Tau in the air, and accordingly they just organize themselves, like subconsciously just shift it around, and bam, they're all organized. It's quite an incredible scene. Uh, seeing this great occult feat, Balkis removes a necklace of pearls which bears a pendant depicting the sun framed within a triangle wrought in gold and covered with precious stones. She then gave it to Adoniram. This, of course, greatly incurred the wrath and jealousy of Solomon. Now, one amazing characteristic of Adoniram is that he could walk barefoot upon red-hot metal, and he wears a simple white woolen apron that falls down to his knees. He also generally does not wear a shirt, if that makes him even more impressive, because of course it is. He walks around as such during the casting of the Brazen Sea. Now, you'll remember the names of the three craftsmen given by Hector in his variation of the temple legend, Fanor, Amru, and Methuselah. These are similar but slightly misspelled of the names given by Dinerval, with the addition detailed that Methusael, as uh, who is of the tribe of Reuben, that's what Dinerval tells us. Now, Benani discovers them behind the furnace for the Brazen Sea, calling to each other in strange words like Vemahia, uh, one would call out, and the other would respond, Eliael. Now, I have no idea what these mean. At one time, I thought they could be variations on a couple of the names of the Shemhamafresh, but I no longer believe that. The Ia and the El at the end of the words mean gone. But since these are rendered in French, and I not knowing what the Hebrew letters did involve may be intending, uh, these words are pretty much just open to speculation. 
curiously here, Dinerval is juxtaposing two aspects of Adoniram's life, his birth and his death. The father of Methuselah in the Bible is Enoch. Enoch is the name of the city Adoniram discovered and studied inside of, built by Cain. Here, Anokia is the city that births Adoniram's genius. And as we will see, Methuselah will help end Adoniram's life. Now, Banani, he overhears them describing the uh, specifics of how they're going to sabotage the casting of the brazen sea. Uh, Fanor mixed uh, limestone into the brick so that uh, the lime will crumble to dust. Amarati uh, prolonged the crossbars of the beams so that the fire will reach them. And uh, Methusel added bitumen and sulfur from the poisonous lake of Gomorrah into the molten mix. Now, Banani then rushed to Solimon and begged him to stop the work, but it was too late. Uh, the casting had already begun, so Banani rushed back to the work and threw himself into the channel that he might sacrifice himself to stop the molten river. But Adoniram, not recognizing who it was, dashed over with an iron fork and plunged it into the chest of Banani, and with superhuman strength removed him from the channel and the molten bronze flowed forth. And the scene, of course, was a total disaster. The molten metal overflowed the channel. Uh, Adoniram uh, hastily released the water, but this turned catastrophic. Uh, the two elements collide violently, uh, causing molten bronze to shoot up like fiery arrows into the air and rain down upon the masses, which killed anyone it struck. It's, it's an incredibly described scene. Now, ashamed, Adoniram turns and walks into the flames. And while standing there amongst his ruin, a giant figure, Tubalcane, of course, calls out to Adoniram, calls his name three times from within the flames, and he passes his hand over Adoniram's forehead, which allows him to breathe within the fire. Now this gesture of passing his hand over Adoniram's forehead is possibly symbolic of the mark of Cain. Tubalcane then takes Adoniram to the center of the earth, to Enochia. And he discovers a vast city inhabited by shadowy people working tirelessly. Uh, here he can escape the tyranny of God and eat of the tree of knowledge and stand upon, quote, the great emerald, which is a root, the pivot, for the mountain of Kaf. Now, Mount Kaf, or uh, Kaf Kun, is a mysterious mountain in Middle Eastern and Islamic lore. Uh, amongst the, you know, some very old Iranian traditions, uh, it was the abode of demons, uh, the highest mountain, and one of extreme remoteness. In the apocryphal uh, Testament of Solomon, largely recensions A and B, there is a demon, Rabdos, uh, who is summoned and bound by Solomon, and who leads a servant of the king to the mountains to discover a green stone, a large green stone, that was used to adore the temple and the altar of incense. In the Sanctuary of Fire, Adoniram learns many secrets, such as where precious gems come from, the source of heat upon the earth, the origin of human life, and why we must die, and the petty wretchedness of God. He once again encounters those figures and creatures that inspired him many years ago in that subterranean cavern, sphinxes and griffins and dog-headed monkeys, etc. Then he meets Cain himself, who tells Adoniram that it was Eblis, the angel of light, that impregnated Eve and gave birth to Cain. Now, Eblis, or Iblis, is, uh, in a sense, the devil in Islam, and is the chief of the species of fire gem, known as Afrit, also known as Shaitea, Satan. Uh, he's mentioned several times in the Quran, and is best known for his fall from grace because he would not bow down to Adam when Allah ordered all the angels to do so. In short, Adoniram is of divine origin, a descendant of Cain, a son of Satan himself. It should be noted that Satan was frequently utilized by the Bohemian writers and various romantics as a symbol of rebellion. Denerval's use of Satan as the progenitor of Adoniram simply establishes him as a rebel hero. Adoniram sees many other things and people and learns many other great secrets, such as the mystery of the Tao. One of the most revealing things he learns is that the children of the genie are to be forever enslaved as creators, inventors, and artists for the ungrateful sons of Adam. Then Tubal-Cain sends Adoniram back with his hammer, 
and at first light of morning, Adoniram goes back to work and finishes the Brazen Sea in three days. Nice. As should be noted, the boat Dinerval and Hecthorn both refer to Tubalcane as a giant, or very large in stature. And uh, Dinerval mentions several times that Adoniram is of extraordinarily large build. Uh, there is also the element of Cain being of divine origin, the son of Eblis, uh, the rebel angel. Uh, there is a passage in the book of Genesis that sheds light upon who exactly Adoniram is. He is a descendant of the Nephilim, or sometimes known as giants, born of the union of angels and human women, which the flood was meant to exterminate. Now, there is no mythic tradition, or mystical tradition, or any tradition that I am aware of that asserts that Cain was one of the Nephilim. Uh, rather, it seems to be another unique element of Dinerval's idiosyncratic symbolic writing. Now, one curious uh, specific thing Hecthorne speaks of that is a blatant clue that his temple legend is derived in some manner from Dinerval is that he mentions Balkis having a bird named Hadhat. Dinerval calls this very same bird Hud Hud. The bird is, according to Dinerval, a hopo bird. Uh, which bears uh, omens in various Arab traditions. Uh, it is prophesied that whomever the bird lands upon is the destined husband of the Queen of Saba in Dinerval's tale. Uh, so when Adoniram makes a sign of the towel in the air, the bird lands upon him, thus fulfills the oracle. Interestingly, hopo birds were a common motif in uh, Old Kingdom Egypt tomb paintings and carvings, uh, sometimes held by a young boy. Uh, one interpretation of this motif is that the Hopo designated the boy as his father's successor, as the boy is usually uh, carries a staff to represent familial duties. Uh, the bird's crowned head may have been the reason for utilizing the Hopo in such a way, as it would indicate familial rule or patriarchal succession. Now, the name Hud Hud is not some strange invention of Dinerval, but is rather taken straight from the Quran. King Solomon had a host of jinn, birds, horses, and men at his command. Now, one of his officers was a bird named Hud Hud, and uh, came to him to inform him that the people of the south, the Yemenites, or the Sabians, worshipping the sun instead of Allah, Solomon sent a letter to the queen asking her to come to him and submit to Allah. Uh, while the queen was en route to Jerusalem, Solomon asked his courtiers to bring him the throne befitting of the queen. A uh, jinn offers uh, his service, as did an Israelite. They brought to Solomon a throne similar to the queen's, but better, in order to impress her with the marvels of the Almighty and his servant, Solomon. When Solomon showed her his palace, paved with slabs of glass, uh, she knew only God was worthy of worship, and thus submitted to Allah. Thus is Denerval's source for Hud Hud, as is derived from the Quran. Now, King Suleiman, back in Denerval's tale, knowing the conspiracy to sabotage the Braden Sea, calls the three craftsmen to appear before him. Suleiman has learned that the queen and Adoniram plan to flee the city in secret to be with each other. He conspires with the three craftsmen to do away with Adoniram, which the companions believe to mean to murder him. It is around this point in the tale that Dinerval gives away, like, a lot of secrets of Freemasonry, uh, namely a lot of words and passwords. Dinerval tells us that uh, what we call the word was the original password, but this has been changed on the last day, but the passwords we use today, kind of. It's mixed up in its strange ways and it's altered, and, and... But after the wages were paid to the craft, Adoniram was attacked by the three companions in an attempt to extort the master's password. Methusael, the miner, struck Adoniram in the head with a hammer. Fainor, the mason, stabbed him uh, in the side with a chisel, and Amru, carpenter finally killed him by stabbing Adoniram in the heart with a set of compasses. They then carry the body to a, quote, solitary hillock beyond the road to Bethany, where they bury him. As a note, Bethany, though its location is uh, disputed, is known to be east of Jerusalem, because that's important. Because the kingdom was in uproar over the artist's death, uh, King Solomon ordered nine masters to go in search of the body. 
Seventeen days later, they discovered a dead bough of acacia rising from the earth with a hopo bird upon it. Now, one of the masters pulled it up, and they then uncovered the body of Adoniram. They tried to raise the body from its grave using like, the grips, but when the skin slipped from the flesh, uh, one of them cried out, Macbedoc, uh, which Nerval tells us means the flesh leaves the bone. They then agree that this word should be the new word of the masters. Now, the three murderers then flee to Maka, that is Mecca, but were executed by workmen there for having been discovered to be false brothers trying to collect wages. The descendants of Adoniram and Balkis uh, become known as the Sons of the Widow. Adoniram's body was buried underneath the altar of the temple, which then enraged God so much that God then left the Ark of the Covenant and abandoned the temple forevermore. This more or less concludes the tale according to Nerval. Uh, there is more romance between Adoniram and Balkis, more scheming by Solomon, and more magical happenings, but that mostly concludes the tale. Now, bit more analysis. This tale was originally a projected masterpiece of Denerval for some time. His original plans for this tale was to be produced as a grand opera, of which he had written libretto for. Uh, he appears to have desired to co-write it with uh, Alexander Dumas, a known Freemason. Uh, unfortunately, those plans fell through. Denerval, after his travels through the Middle East, began to publish Journey to the Orient in uh, installments in the literary periodical Revue de Deux uh, Mondes. I don't speak French. Being late on delivering the one uh, one of the installments, uh, Denerval decided uh, instead of trying to force something of his travels in the in the Middle East, he just decided he'd send in this tale that he had already written, uh, claiming he had heard it in a Turkish coffee shop. Uh, this is how the tale makes its way into the book, and then part of the book that seems rather unusual. In fact, its whole presence in the book is rather unusual altogether, uh, seeming to be randomly inserted into the narrative. Because it was, because he was late on sending in a, a piece of writing. The tale was so sensational and inspiring that influenced numerous writers and composers and Freemasons and conspiracy theorists alike. One of the great masters of 19th century that uh, this tale inspired was uh, the great composer Charles Gounod, the composer of Faust and Ave Maria, who would write uh, La Reina de Saba, or The Queen of Sheba, in 1862, which was then later translated into English as Irene, in 1865 by Henry Farney. Hecthorne would not have derived his temple legend from either Gnod or Farney's works, uh, though he may have been familiar with them, as uh, they may have introduced the tale to him. However, it's clear that he derived his condensed version of the legend from Denerval's work itself. Uh, he had read this uh, work by, by Denerval, as he uses the same names as Denerval in producing this, uh, with some spelling differences. Gnod and Farney changed the names of many of the characters, with Soliman as Suleiman, uh, Balkis as Irene, uh, Adoniram as Muriel, Benani as Pascal, and the three craftsmen as uh, Zoras, the carpenter, uh, Raphael, the mason, and uh, uh, Fenoa, uh, the miner. Uh, Farney's Irene differs from Gnod's uh, La Reine de Saba, only in the location of the opera. Uh, Gunnod honestly follows Denerval's work by setting the opera in Jerusalem, whereas Farney transplants the scene to Constantinople, and instead of working on King Solomon's temple, they are working on the Great Mosque of Suleiman. Further, it seems, even the great conspiracy theorist and hoaxist Leo Taxol uh, was inspired to reiterate Denerval's tale. Uh, Taxol claims that the tale was the original Hieromic drama known to all Masons, but owing to its anti-Christian themes, it was pared down and censored into its current form in the third degree. Like many Masonic conspiracy theories, it very well may have been Taxel who pushed this peculiar legend into the mainstream, and why this legend has survived with some popularity amongst zealously esoteric masons such as Rudolf Steiner. Now, before concluding, there are two questions that probably 
come to mind upon hearing this tale. Was the Gerard de Nerval a Freemason, and where did he get this legend? First of all, no, he was not a Freemason. That much we know. And second, he made it up. It's his own version. Of a, it's a strictly Masonic legend, but he made it his own. It's his own version he made up according to his artistic genius. There is no known record of Denerval's involvement in a lodge or with masonry in general. He did have a fascination with the occult, and he did associate with many occultists and Freemasons. So where did he learn the secrets of masonry? Is that when I've talked about this tale with other people, they tend to go, well, how did he know the secrets? Well, well like many things, like Duncan's Ritual, uh-huh. He probably learned it from one of numerous Masonic exposés that were published in France during the previous century. There were at least six known French Masonic exposés at that time that he would have had access to, and he did have a significant library. But it is also possible he may have learned it from the known Freemasons he associated with. Yeah, it's not like a Freemason never revealed any secrets. That's how they, they write down the exposés. <laughs> The one likely suspect is Honoré de Balzac, who frequently uh, participated in the Club of Hashish Eaters with Gerard d'Interval, and may have divulged Masonic secrets while under the influence of hashish, or uh, cannabis resin. So why did d'Interval choose the Hieromic drama in his journey to the Orient? And why did he choose to divulge like, many secrets of masonry there? Uh, who knows why he chose to divulge the secrets uh, he illicitly learned. Um, since the passwords correspond to various uh, things concerning King Solomon's temple, he may have felt that they were appropriate to reinforce his personal symbolism. Or he may have just simply done it because he could. Well, why not? So we have traced the temple legend as told by Steiner, in which he, like his source, Charles Hecthorn, believed it to be a real Masonic legend, when in fact it was just a poetic tale devised entirely by Gerard d'Interval's artistic genius inspired by a Masonic legend. How do we know this is where the trail ends? How do we know that d'Interval did not get this peculiar version of the Hieromic drama from some obscure Masonic order, or perhaps is now some lost expose or some deceased loose tongue brother? How do we know that Gerard d'Interval didn't just like make this up? Firstly, there's just no evidence of this variation being found in any Masonic order prior to Denerval. So that ends up being purely speculative. Secondly, uh, Denerval was inimitable. He was just so original, so artistically brilliant that I and probably many others would be disappointed to learn he just copied this from some now defunct Masonic order. Uh, in fact, such seems to be like anti Nerval. Uh, that just does not sound like him. He could not even write about his tours in the Middle East without modifying them with poetic license. Why would he just suddenly copy someone else's work and even dream of putting it on as a grand opera for it? Further, there's just a lot of blasphemy in this tale. Solomon is a fool. God is oppressive. Uh, Satan is the progenitor of the hero. Uh, the world will worship fire once more one day. It's just, it's not very Masonic, is it? Further, it's very erotic for a Masonic legend, if it was one. It just seems incredibly unlikely to be a real Masonic variation. And given Denerval's character, it's just most likely to be of his own mind. Denerval certainly had a great deal of sympathy for the Masonic Hiram Abiff, the tragic artist hero. Denerval certainly felt that the artist was not well respected in his era, hence his life as a bohemian, and felt that the artist was just already a tragic person. To be an artist was already tragic. Uh, Hiram Abiff in some strange way fits this model, and through his ever complex symbolism, Denerval transforms the Hieromic drama into a tale of his own. The story as Denerval tells it uh, has nothing to do with masonry but is more of how Denerval's understanding of masonry fits into his own symbolic interpretation of the world. In other words, we have traced how this beautiful poetic tale became a Masonic farce in occult and Masonic circles. And in a way, it is a Masonic farce. This tale should not be taken as a Masonic legend. 
Not only does it ignore the brilliant mind of Denerval, but it dismisses the deep symbolism and profound meaning Denerval was endeavoring to communicate. If we take Rudolf Steiner seriously, all that beautiful poetry and meaning is wiped clean and becomes some Rosicrucian legend that not even Steiner feels comfortable trying to convey. He just simply... <laughs> Steiner just writes, he just cops out and says, only the true adept understands this. Way to cheat your audience, Steiner. There is no great Masonic secret here. There is not a great revelation. Well, there is a great revelation, but it must be reinterpreting the hieromic drama through the lens of Dinnerval, not the other way around. We should be examining Dinnerval's personal symbolism and individual mysticism to unlock the great revelations and the dark treasure trove, Dinnerval's beautifully haunted mind. Wow. Well, all I can say is that I had heard this legend. I've read this book when I came through all of this in, in kind of a early time in my Masonic history, as many of us do who are looking for additional, additional symbolism. In fact, just last year at Esotericon 2022, Brother P.D. Newman told the story and he talked about Daniel Vall's work. And he talked about this alternate Haramic legend. Perhaps they're on alternate spectrums, P.D. Newman and Patrick Day. For me, I really enjoyed the way Patrick took apart this legend and praises Danerval and his writing, and truly his ending about understanding the Haramic legend through the lens of Danerval's thinking is what I found most valuable. We know, of course, that even the Haramic legend as we have it today, which is not the version you just heard, so no, no secrets have been spoiled, even this is a dramatic retelling, and a creative work whose progenitors remain a mystery. That's all for this week. I want to ask the Craftsman Plus to please give your thoughts on this Haramic legend. And if you've heard other Haramic legends, please feel free to link books or articles to this question in the Craftsman Plus group. I want to say thank you one more time for coming with us on this journey. Thanks to our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners. And if you can't wait to hear this awesome interview we got with Brother Bob Cooper, the Grand Historian, or the previous prior Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, who you've probably seen on TV, well, the wait isn't too long. Next Sunday, 9.30 Central, we'll have that interview for you. And it will be a YouTube special as well. So we'll have a premiere for it, a little countdown, and it is a video interview as well. So for our podcast listeners, if you want to check out our YouTube channel, head on over there, give us a like, a subscribe, all that good stuff. It helps us get Masonic information that is factual and believable and uh, responsible, filtered to the top. We don't need conspiracy theorists popping off and ruining the reputation of Freemasonry or getting people to have the wrong idea of what Masonic education is. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media. That's it. Okay, girl.